evening and what up though detroit you are watching in session on wjzz cool tv the coolest station in the world with myself dr t dr fista and we have a very special guest today <laughs> we will be talking about sexual sexual dysfunctions with sex expert Jessica Ross. Ross. So happy to have and we've her. had her on the phone on the show before. So welcome back, Jessica. We did. We had her one amongst other speakers, and we really wanted her by herself yes. this time because uh, we could only get so much out of her last time. Um, but Jessica, tell tell us about you. Uh, start us out. Who you yeah, are? So do and where are you? Okay, so. My practice is located in Sterling Heights and I am a certified sex therapist and trauma specialist. And so I spend most of my day talking about all things sex, everything from education to exploration and doing this with all ages. So it's it's really an exciting conversation at helping people just realize their own sexuality or helping them to understand things that have happened to them that weren't actually sex and were abuse and helping them distinguish from that. Um, and so I am in a multidisciplinary private practice where we focus on sexual health and mental health uh, combined through the use of therapy, yoga, and then nutrition services. Oh, wow. That's very interesting and unique to have all those things in one place because you're really coming from that holistic perspective that way. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, Jessica, we often, struggle to refer clients who have major sexual dysfunctioning or some form of sexual issues right and uh, you know we're, we're trying to be therapists but that is a very specific niche and i know uh you having been my former colleague uh, you went to u of m and you trained very heavily in uh, uh, dealing mm -hmm. with these, uh, scenarios so uh to start out tell us what is uh, 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 the most common problems that you've seen with uh, respect to sexual dysfunction? Yeah. So, well, actually, tell us yeah. what, what sexual dysfunction is and then tell us what you have seen the most. So we'll start out with understanding so who the World Health Organization, they identify sexual function or dysfunction. It's, it's not just the absence of uh, or sexual health, excuse me, it's not just infirmity or the absence thereof, but it's the the whole nature of a person and their being and how they're able to express explore uh and and be a commune in in their sexuality and so when we talk about sexual dysfunction we're talking about the the impairment of the sexual response cycle so everything from and the response cycle includes desire arousal uh peak resolution and then, you know, or excuse me, an orgasm, not in that order, but anything that disrupts any part of that sexual cycle for anything, any person. And so typically what happens is at any, at any point, they end up coming to talk to me um, about that and trying to repair that. So that might be low sexual desire. That's one of the things we see most often, uh, especially between couples. Someone has, is no longer interested in sex or there's other things outside the couple impacting the couple's ability to be intimate or together, whether that be a delayed ejaculation, premature ejaculation, pain with intercourse, or some people who've never experienced orgasm. And so sex isn't interesting because they don't feel like they are able to gain anything from the experience. Um, the other thing that we see a lot uh, changes in sexual performance due to chronic illness or age. That's another thing that comes up quite often for people. And then trauma, trauma, having sex used as a weapon against them and not knowing how to engage as a sexual being in adulthood. Wow, that was a lot. That was a lot. <laughs> and, and to break that down, if I was to uh, summarize that a bit, uh, Jessica, and try to even grasp the concept you're, you're referring to. So we're talking about physiological, some form of dysfunctioning, so to speak as well as emotional or psychological. Yes, so yes. So would, uh, would it make uh, sense if I said that one of your first tasks, so to speak, once you assess a person who comes in with some form of sexual problem is for you to determine which, uh, which side you're looking at, so to speak? So yeah, so a big part of that is doing a full biopsychosocial. So my first question is where did the referral come from? How did you find me? 
And so my job is to work in conjunction with medical providers. It's a very important piece because I do need to rule out if there's an actual medical concern on the table. So for example, if someone is experiencing vaginal dryness, they're post 50, they're having atrophy in the vagina pain during intercourse, and they're coming to see me because they feel like it might be a relationship issue, I might refer them out because maybe they're starting intermenopause early and right, they might need support other than just therapy. Therapy to help them through what do I do once I get you know medicine or once I get support around that medically. And then sometimes it's the other way around. The doctors, it's kind of the doctors, I'm gonna close this. Okay, the doctors assess them and has decided that there might be uh, what we call uh, uh, pelvic or GPPD, excuse me, genital pelvic pain and penetration disorder, which means they might be experiencing, women might be experiencing pain at penetration, but it may be anxiety as opposed to an actual muscle issue. So that could be another way that they end up coming to see me. That's actually um, one of the things that Dr. Fisher and I was talking about right before you entered, um, before we um, came on live, um, I was telling him that I know someone who hadn't had sex with her husband for over 50 years because she had the apathy and it caused pain when she had sex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And a lot of physicians, unfortunately, don't they don't actually talk about sex. And so that's where we're short sighted in our uh, medical industry is that they may ask you. Um, if there's atrophy down there, if they're pain, they may give you Primarin or other creams to help with that, but they're not going to actually ask you about sex or sexual satisfaction or pleasure. And so those things become missed. And we know that 76% of people are better actually want to talk to their medical doctors about this, but they're afraid to make them uncomfortable. And so now we have a group of people who more than 51% of people are experiencing sexual dysfunction but not able to talk about it or to seek proper care or treatment for it. And you said 51% of the American population are experiencing sexual dysfunction, uh, is that what I heard? And the numbers are somewhere around 51% for men, 31 to 47% for women that are experiencing uh, sexual dysfunction that has been, and we're always looking at what's reported, right? And so how many more people are not reporting that they're experiencing some sort of disruption to their sexual experience. Exactly. And do you think some of that is due to shame and guilt and, and affects the, uh, a person's self-esteem? Absolutely. Shame is a huge thing when it comes to sex. One of the first questions I ask anybody in my office, one of the first questions I ask during my trainings, how did you learn about sex? What were the messages that you were given? What's the belief system your understanding of sex is built around? And once I know that, then I, I, it gives me a better idea of how I help you and, and what kind of, of, of barriers we have to climb over. Because there, sex is um, taught in a couple different ways. And I, you, you may be familiar with this, but we are either, we grow up in a sexually restrictive environment, a sexually repressive environment, a sexually supportive environment, or a sex positive environment. And those all can have very different impacts on how we view our own sexuality and how we're willing to talk to others about it. Can you just briefly go over how those four different um, upbringings can lead a person into their sexual awareness? I guess that's the right words I want to use. Or know. to some sexual behaviors that may or may not be healthy, so to speak. Yeah. So when we think of restrictive, sometimes we think of this tied to very religious communities that may not talk about sex and it's not always tied to religion but that may not talk about sex at all they don't have conversations about it we don't teach our children about it it is not communicated in any sense of the word uh, and then we have sexually repressive communities which means sex is normalized for one group of people but not for others so for example there are gender differences men are able to sow their wild oats at a certain age Whereas if women do that, they might be thought of as whores or they're no longer able to be married. And so we have these these stereotypes and these gender norms and these generalizations that we're operating under. And so we repress one group of people and allow another group of people to bloom. When we think of supportive, we want to think about a family that they may talk about sex or normalize sex, but they're not giving you detailed information. 
they'll answer questions that are asked of them. They will give you condoms if you need condoms, uh, birth control if you need birth control, but we're not having any in-depth conversation about relationships and intimacy and, and pleasure. Whereas sex positive is more of this idea is here's all the information and I'm going to teach you how to make a choice as opposed to telling you what your choices should be. Very interesting, Jessica. And, you know, um, just thinking personally uh, and, and with many people I know, there is also, I think, this cultural component involved, like you mentioned, religion and other uh, cultures where sex conversation is just a taboo, right? Exactly. And apparently mm -hmm. what Jessica is saying, that's just not a healthy way to approach it with your child. And then you have people, families who opt out from the sex education middle school for their children, yeah. right? Yeah. Which uh, um, I, I yeah. never understood that. I said, okay, don't leave it to me. Take it to school. <laughs> go and learn about it, right? I was all for that. Well, but you have so some that. parents that think if you teach or talk about sex, that's going to lead into more exactly, of it. Exactly. It's going to lead the child to engage in sex or to um, engage in sexual activities early on. When mm -hmm. actually, that's not really the case. When you talk to no. your children at an early age, give them the information they're more likely to make the decision to abstain from sex more so than engage in it because they have all the information that they need. And, you know, here's the interesting part. So you talked about the school system and, and the sex ed classes. What's interesting is that in Michigan, so every uh, state has something different. And CECAS is part of the group that helps to uh, navigate around policy and procedure. So there's a whole policy and procedure around how sex should be talked about in schools. But in Michigan, uh, sex conversations don't have to be medically accurate. And in a lot of states, this is true. The only thing that it has to include in Michigan is information about HIV and AIDS. Uh, and in some, and it cannot include uh, information about uh, Reproduct, not reproduction, but the use of condoms and sorts. So we have to preach abstinence only. And so each state has its own rules uh, around how they even talk about sex. And so what shocked me is you're telling me you're going to give my child a lesson on sex, but it doesn't have to be medically accurate, which means you you will provide misinformation for them. Right. Potentially yeah. so. Yes. Um, about sex or or should the school teach sex education? Thank you, Didi, because that was my question. So good job there. <laughs> Go ahead, Jessica. No, well, great question. That's a wonderful question. So my answer to this question every single time is from the cradle to the grave. You talk mm -hmm. about sex from day one because you are giving messages to your child from day one. Don't leave it up to the school. As I just said, they may give inaccurate information and incomplete information. And so you need to arm your kids with, first off, let me start here. Figure out what your own views around sex and sexuality are. How right. did you grow up and what messages are you giving out? Because if you grew up and you feel a particular way about how you dress or how women are supposed to look or how men are supposed to look, we have to think about, are we giving those messages to our children? So you start talking to them from day one because their body image is, is happening right away. You go to the doctor, they tell you your baby's fat and your baby's six months old and that you need to put the baby on a diet. That's sexuality right there. So we're already talking about it. They're, they're already being body shamed and they don't have the ability to walk or talk yet. Wow. There, we have kids who start masturbating as young as three years old. They're not necessarily seeking pleasure, but they're touching their bodies and it feels good. We're not shaming them. We're just going to teach them, well, here's something that's private and here's how you do that. And so you start talking to them right away because by the time they get to high school, it's too late. Absolutely. By then they may even have a child. Well, I'll tell you something funny. I just found out my six-year-old was kissing a girl behind the swing. <laughs> so all of which, what I hear Jessica say is we all need to see a Jessica raising these kids because <laughs> who on earth knows all these uh, things, Jessica? And, and parents are fearful of this, this um, yeah. act that is meant to be fun and good. But then our kids, it's like, what do you do with that? Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, before we go... And, and continue really quick. You are watching In Session on WJZZ Cool TV, the coolest station in the world, streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. Please like, share, follow, and subscribe. If you would like to join the conversation, 
and talk to Jessica, please call us at 313-355-6018. Our phone lines are open. Now, Jessica, I, and I assume many parents have this kind of difficulty I'm about to describe. Once the kids are grow to 10, 11, 12, 13, somewhere around there, that puberty starts to uh, uh, take a hold, so to speak, yes. right? The mood changes mm -hmm. affects emotionally and, and all those mm -hmm. elements that we know about. Now, because the puberty is coming in, oftentimes kids will push their parents away mm -hmm. because I believe it's a result of what you said, not having had these conversations earlier on, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Now, shame, yes. sort of image, and you know, these are all issues for me. Now, yes. even uh, talking to those parents who already might have missed a step or two in early on, and by the way, so uh, starting right, but how can they, for lack of better uh, uh, explanation, how can they repair what they could have done differently very early on, given that we talk to a parent of 12, 13, 14 years old? And, add, and just to add a caveat to that question, um, because it's in line with what Didi underscore 21 is asking, about how do parents combat the false information they mm -hmm. receive from their peers? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the first thing I'm going to say, if we're already having these conversations, when that false information comes up, sometimes kids will combat it themselves. That's not accurate. Where did you get that from? Right. But the but the reverse and what you're asking in terms of, well, if we already missed that boat and we need to try and support them after, what do we do? we open the communication lines. The truth is they may never come back around, but they will notice that you're open. We do normalize. We do start asking questions. Well, how, how is your relationship going? How are your relationships? And we, we start at a affection and acknowledgement and we work up to asking questions about intercourse. So we don't jump in and say, well, are you having sex? I just need to know that. So we talk about how are your relationships going? What is it like to engage with other people? How do you know when you like someone? What feels good to you? And we just start normalizing and asking these questions. And maybe we start sharing with, you know, I realize that there are some things I didn't talk to you about. And I realize that's because I didn't have the information and didn't know how to do it. I'm wondering if we could start to have that conversation now. So you wouldn't recommend, for example, having a father go into the exam room with their daughter just to make sure that their hymen is intact? No. It's highly inappropriate. It violates your sexual rights. So there are 16 sexual rights. That's a violation of that because you have bodily integrity and autonomy. Um, and so the, the question is more so talk to your kids outside of that and ask questions. And the best we can do is hope that they're telling us the truth. We know that they people, parents are going to scream at me for saying this, but they also deserve a level of privacy uh, in their exploration. And we all had it we all chose to do things in a particular kind of way some of us that's why we're worried and so it's just learning to open those doors as much as possible and not put in shame or fear into them Jessica, what are some of the most common sexual rights that people uh, uh, violate without meaning to violate uh, the, the, the the very first one is that autonomy and that integrity piece and taking people's choice away from their body example would be go give grandma a hug go let uncle so-and-so give you a kiss that's already a violation because that's not my choice and i feel forced to do it and i get i tell you quite often that turns into adulthood that we allow people to touch us that we don't want to and it's uncomfortable and we feel like we have to behave the correct way Jesus. when it comes it's deep. Yeah. Ooh, that yeah. we grab kids and kiss them all the time, right? Right, and, then and we do. And, and sometimes we run after them see, if they run. Right, and you see kids, they'll push away and they're like, no, 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 I don't want to kiss you. And, and we force it on them. Yes. To me, and with you saying it, because you don't really think about that. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. So but we're putting children in a peculiar situation to, at the beginning, to let them know that your body is not your body. And if somebody mm -hmm. wants to give you, say, for example, a, a kiss, grandma wants to give you a kiss and you don't want to, you have to. So you are mm -hmm. already being groomed for certain behaviors without even yes. knowing it. And, I, and parents do it without knowing. And that's not sure. even the intent. Right. Sure. Mm -hmm. So all of those, mm -hmm. that one, on the very first one, 
it would be ideal to let the kid reach out to you for a hug or kiss or play versus you running after the kid and cornering them, so to speak. Exactly. And yeah. don't force your kids to touch people if they don't want to. Uh, because, again, we're teaching them that it's OK to do stuff that you don't want to do. So, uh, so no, you, you, you give don't. Uncle Johnny, give Uncle Johnny a hug. He's here. Show up. No. Right. OK. No. I got you. All right. Because what you don't know is that Uncle Johnny might have made improper passes at that child or might have hugged that child way too long. And that child has just never disclosed that to you because every time you've said, go do this, even though the child looks squeamish or uncomfortable. Um, what we know is that kids are more likely to be harmed by family than they are by people who are outside. So that's the other reason for that, um, that happens. The other right, say the, uh, the other one that comes up quite often is the right to privacy and the right to information. Those two are violated quite often. Well, I don't know, because I, when I was raised in my parents' home, that was their home, and I didn't have a right to privacy. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel deals. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I didn't have yeah. that, that right. And mm -hmm. not, nobody closed their bedroom door. The only door that was closed was maybe the bathroom door. Well, not maybe, but was the bathroom door when you mm -hmm. had to take care of your business. Dr. T, when it comes to parents, that it was the good olden days. You try that now, the kid locks the door, shots at that. Basically, you run out fast before it hits you, right? Yeah, but, but I was a different type of kid. I didn't have anything to hide. So I didn't can you come in my room. Because usually if you come in my room, that means you're dropping something off. So, so <laughs> that was fine with me. Often you see uh, uh, early teen teenagers kind of wanting their privacy that way, shutting the door. And parents often, they get uncomfortable with that. Right, because like you said, I'm doing everything, I'm giving them everything, working hard. And here's the kids just locking me out of their room. Right. All of a sudden now, I wonder mm -hmm. if some of that can be correlated with their sexual feeling, desire, thoughts, and what have you. Well, let's be real. Kids want to talk to their friends. They want to laugh at funny jokes. They want to watch inappropriate things. They want to masturbate. They want to play Minecraft. They, they want to do these things and they want to do them without having to explain to you that they want to do them. I mean, as adults, we don't walk in a room, you know, we don't go and say, well, I want to masturbate. Can everybody just go away or I want to have sex with my husband or wife partner, whatever it is. We don't do that. We just kind of go in our rooms, we close our door and we go towards our privacy. And so that idea with privacy is that I get it. I came from the same thing. You don't have privacy. I'll pay the bills. But the idea is whatever you're teaching them now, they hold on to as, as adults. And so how do you teach them that you actually trust them when you're busting down the doors and you're making them leave the doors open? You're not teaching trust. So when it comes to computers and tablets and all of these things, teach them how to use it. Yep, sex ads are going to pop up. You're going to see somebody doing something on a computer that you, you aren't necessarily old enough to do because you don't have all the information. I need you to just X out of that. And maybe we'll change the website or maybe we'll go to different spaces. Or put some parental blocks in. And this prompts uh, mm -hmm. another big question and area that I think most people are struggling with nowadays, this world of internet, that's really out of mm -hmm. control, right? And I don't care how good you are, someone else is better than you at that. And these kids seem to know more. They than, know more than, than, than adults. So <laughs> Jessica, in your practice and seeing people, uh, many people coming to you for some of these issues, yeah. what are you seeing, number one, with respect to this whole internet world and, and, and sex advertising, what have you? And how do people, how can people deal with that? Yeah, so a lot of people feeling like they have addictions or that their child is, um, or husband or wife, that they're out of control because they are interested in these things or like these things or have a lot of access to sexual imagery. Um, and what I tell people is no, usually it's, it's just like smoking or running for some people. It, it's not an addiction it's more this idea of coping we've chosen a really poor coping uh skill and so that skill has been to fast forward into porn and for others it's just curiosity they have an access to this whole wide world and so uh, some of us had magazines and books we found in our parents rooms or that we found in the back of the you know local store others had peep shows and so it's not that this stuff hasn't existed it just exists on a much more 
I guess, easily accessible, right, range. Mm -hmm. And so part of that conversation is, well, have you talked to your kids about sex? Have you told them how to properly explore um, sexual imagery? Now, some of us have different morals and we don't want our kids watching pornography. But for others who understand that you're going to do it, whether I say it or not, how about you teach them what ethical porn is? How about you teach them how to do this in a way that is appropriate where they won't harm themselves or get catfished or get taken advantage of um, I just saw that on the news where it's, it's some little girls got uh, that happened here in Michigan. So it's more so about teach them how to use this material and teach them how to combat it and teach them how to use it responsibly if they're going to make choices that you may not morally agree with. Let me ask you a very important and I see it as difficult uh, question. At what age do you actually talk about porn and things you just described what what's what's that age that would be one appropriate to help it mm -hmm. <laughs> by the time you start talking about it they've seen it already <laughs> okay absolutely cradle to the grave so be mindful we watch tv and our kids walk in mm -hmm. and they're like oh somebody's kissing on the screen so they already know that adults do stuff on tv and so now they want to see more of the kissing and they accidentally get to adults making out and they accidentally get to something else. And so we start talking early on about, well, what are we watching? Oh, adults kiss. That's normal. We kiss. That's normal. And so we normalize that. But when it comes to actually some of the hardcore pornography, the moment they get a cell phone or a computer in their hands, you want to have had that safety conversation already. So for some kids now, it's about six to eight that we have to start having these conversations because they have tablets. Remember, COVID hat, hit, hit. Everybody went home with iPads and computers. Right. Yep. Right. And so even my six-year-old went home with an iPad and that they could navigate. And so we start talking about this in age-appropriate manners just early on. You'll see these kind of images. This is what that means. This is what that looks like. While it's normal and sex is healthy, it's also not something that is age-appropriate for you right now. And we can talk about what that looks like for you in the future. But right now, here's what's more appropriate for you. Jessica, you know, you mentioned COVID and, uh, you know, we're always trying to stay up with the latest research. What does it mean for mental health, substance abuse? And yeah. stuff. Uh, but tell us, COVID and sexual dysfunction or behaviors, or have you seen any change? If so, what? And, and what are we expecting out of this whole mess we've been in for over a year now with respect well, to our sexual behaviors? Yeah, so it depends on the research. And some of the research, uh, what we see is that masturbation went up. For some couples, sex seemed to go up, but the reality was that they were just around each other more. For some, relationship satisfaction went down because they were around each other more. There were no breaks. Um, we saw a rise in domestic violence and, and what was happening. And so some of those things actually went very, went, uh, we saw a rise. The other part is that more people started seeking appropriate treatment because now I have to face it. I can't go to work and ignore you for half a day. We haven't had sex in 20 years. And now that I'm with you, I'm sleeping in the same bed as you. You're not working, you're laid off, whatever that looks like. I can't avoid sex with you anymore. There are no more excuses as to why we're not having it. Um, and for some couples, they just felt like, for individuals too, I'm forced to deal with this now because maybe I'm also alone and I want to do solo play, but I have so much shame that I don't know how, but I want to be safe during COVID. Okay. Now, let me ask, we talked about the um, the sexual desire, sexual release, the causes of sexual dysfunction. Can you tell us a little bit about the types of sexual dysfunctions right after this break? You are watching in session on WJZZ Cool TV, the coolest station in the world, streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. Please like, share, follow, and subscribe, and join the conversation by calling 313-355-6018. And we have something about COVID we that you want to say? We don't. I think that's changing the so, uh, oh, okay. So I don't think we have to do the COVID announcement, but if you are interested, you can contact Wayne County Public Health and get more information about scheduling a vaccination. The point of that was to encourage people to get a vaccine, don't listen to social media, messages that may not be yeah, thoroughly true, so. correct. 
Yeah. So mm -hmm. that contact um, the health authority and they can give you a list of what sites you can go to to get vaccinated and to get more information. So back to you, Seth. <laughs> So most common sexual dysfunction dysfunctions that you see? All of them. <laughs> to be truthful, all of them. And so when I look at sexual dysfunction, uh, according to the DSM, I'm looking at premature ejaculation. I'm looking at delayed ejaculation. I'm looking at erectile dysfunction, meaning trouble becoming erect. We're looking at uh, female, they change it to female interest, arousal, sexual uh, dysfunction. We're looking at orgasmic disorder. Uh, we're looking at desire discrepancy or non-concordance, uh, which means I may be physically aroused, but I don't have the desire or I have the desire, but I'm not physically aroused. Um, and then we're looking at GPPD, which is genital pelvic pain and penetration disorder. We used to know that as dyspareunia vulvodynia, um, which is, you know, pain with intercourse. And so with each one of those, what we're looking at is, is there impairment in the relationship or in the relationship with self or others? Um, and is it creating a problem for you? Um, and I'll give you an example. A lot of people show up in my office and say, I have premature ejaculation and I, let's fix this. And I go, OK, how, you know, how long before for you ejaculate? And they go, oh, it's about 10 minutes. That's not PE. Right. PE is 60 seconds or less. Okay. And that 60 seconds or less only matters if it's bothering you. Right. And so if it's not bothering you, we're not considering something a dysfunction. And so people hear that and they go, oh, OK, this is normal. I have ED. Uh, and I'm like, OK, well, what do you mean? Well, it waxes and wanes. We'll be getting it hot and heavy. And then, you know, maybe she gets upset or she has pain and uh, the, the erection goes away. Well, it's supposed to wax and wane. The more excited you get, the right, the more erect you get, the more calm you get, the more it goes away. And so sometimes people show up because they have misconceptions about sex and sexuality. Mm -hmm. Even desire is the biggest one. So many people show up with low sexual desire in couples, not realizing that sex isn't your problem. You don't get along as a couple. That's the problem. And now sex is impacted because you don't get along as a couple. Right. And and and, and you you had you hit that nail right on the head. Most people don't understand the connection between the emotions that you feel between a person and the ability to perform. If you're not attracted to someone or if you are upset with them, it's going to be hard to perform whether you male or female. So mm -hmm. sometimes we have to check our own emotions and say, okay, what's going on with me? Mm -hmm. Why this isn't, um, why I can't have an erection or I'm unable to um, be lubricated. So mm -hmm. thank you for bringing that point up. It's really what I want to say. <laughs> so Jessica, I want to I want to ask you this. Is there a difference uh, in in a way uh, they, there's like the old saying that men are more physical, women are more emotional when it comes to sex and all that. Can you shine some light in that area for us? Yeah, so there is actually a great book that talks about some of this, and it's Come As You Are by Dr. Emily Nagoski. But the idea is that there are more uh, more things alike when it comes to sexuality between men and women than there are between the same, you know, women and women or men and men. And so there are not as many differences as we assume or perceive. It's simply that we live in, in sort of a patri patriarchal society, and so it's deemed that women have had to be quiet about their sexuality there's shame on women about their sexuality and so therefore we are perceived as less sexual because we can't talk about it and then we get in these relationships and people want us to be sexual but i've been shamed all my life or i've been told to be quiet all my life and so it's kind of like how am i going to be a lady in the sheets i think they say or a lady in the street and a freak in the sheets kind of thing that doesn't really exist because mentally we can't transition uh, that easily. And so the other thing I'll say is that men change. When men hit about 40, um, what we see is that sex becomes more in their brain as well and less in their pants. And so for, you know, for all of us, sex desire happens in the brain. It does not happen in your pants. But for men, they start to realize that after about 40. And so what you'll see when a lot of people show up in my door, they're 40 plus if they're men, and they're now starting to have 
sexual dysfunction of some regard, but it's mostly because now their brain has recognized that it is a part of sex too. Okay. Wow. So it's really not a dif dysfunction. It's really just the brain starting to catch up with the little head. So to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And it can create a lot of, a lot of distress. I mean, a lot of people have real physical illness, you know, issues around sex, but for many of them, it's, it's about the beliefs, the shame, the messages that create a lot of our inability to, to perform. And the other, the last thing I'll say is men are taught that sex is performative and that they have to put on a show. And so for when we, you know, when we get to that aspect, that really impacts men as they get older at 30 by 30, 31, most men will have had at least one uh, 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 erection that has gone away, just, just one dysfunction at least. And so as they get older, that starts to get in their brain because they can't perform the same way. And what I teach people is that sex is not a performance. It's not a show you're putting on for someone. It's a shared experience. Yeah, it's only a show if you're a porn star and you're getting paid for it. There you go. <laughs> yes. Or you're one of those other people who does stuff on camera for money, too. So we do have that going on. So. You know, and Jessica, when you describe the cultural component involved in that, I even wonder, you know, when you look at the disparities amongst the pay, right, between a man and, and woman, so to speak, starting with our country and then perhaps uh, mm -hmm. on the world, I wonder if some of that even has an impact in uh, this perception of what that is, the process and how we engage. Because from the get-go, you kind of boom, so to speak, and, and, and you're the under underdog, so to speak, yeah. in so many ways. I think ways. culture plays a mm -hmm. lot to it. But, but generally speaking... Absolutely men and, and women from, from that stand. Do you think that has an impact overall? Absolutely. Culture plays a big part into it. It's how we're normalized. It's how we're socialized. Right? And so these messages, one of the things, and I think uh, I just heard Dr. Lex James talk on this, one of the things that we begin to understand is that our, our messages from a cultural standpoint they're interwoven into everything that we do, from the clothes you buy to the hair to the institutions that you shop at or that you graduate from or that you where you work. It is completely tied in and every you know, every step of the way. And so when people tell me, well, sex is not a part of everything, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. There's no way we can have a conversation about anything and I can't point out the the, the sexual pieces of it. Okay, so also I sometimes I wonder, right? Uh, uh, you know, when you look at the levels of education in our country, the thirty some percent who have a bachelor's degree, forty uh, twenty some percent who have a master's degree, then you going into one. Now, let me ask you this, Jessica: How are people supposed to know some of this stuff? How do you get educated at the front? Where do you get this? All of them <laughs> having to come and see. That's an excellent question. All of them having to come and see you, and there isn't enough of you out there because we all know that, right? We refer people to you for some of yeah, these issues. Yeah, because I even think mm -hmm. most parents get their information from what we what they watch or guests. Yeah, they don't know. Right, right, right. Or from what their friends tell them, and and even what their parents tell Correct. them, which could be a fallacy. Yep. And we're mm -hmm. continuing to. Um, tell these fallacies for generations and generations. Yes, yes, yes. So one is find good books. Um, I think, who is this? Boys, there's Boys and Sex by Peggy Ornstein. There's, there's tons of good material out there where you can go and you can pick up some appropriate material. I don't know what, how to talk to my kid or, or my parent doesn't know how to talk to me. And so there, there are definitely books out there that you can read and get material on. Here's how I support that. The other part is seekers.org. They help to put out the manuals for here's how we talk to kids. Here's how, here's what? the information that they need to know. Say that again. What's the website? I it's, yep, I believe it's S I E C U S. I think that work. Mm -hmm. And so, right. yep, there's a lot of information there. Uh, there's a couple of different YouTubers that give out. Uh, I think Sex Exploration is one of them. I can't think of her name. And so there are a couple of different informative YouTubers that give out information that is uh, appropriate and can go through different age spans that help us to learn about our bodies. 
But I, but again, the, the biggest thing is grab a book and dive in um, and and make sure it's appropriate. Even on my website, I have a list for parents if they have questions, whether their child is um, a, a person with a disability, whether their child is just curious or want to know more or whether they just want to understand more about, well, how do I introduce certain topics and vice versa. If the kids are interested in, in material, there are a couple of appropriate things for them as well. Can you please give us your website? Yep, my website is uh, Jessica, www.jessicaljross.com. Jessica, is uh, obvious that you're saying healthy sex is really good. That's the feeling I get from our conversation here. Why is it good? What's happening? What are the benefits of sex? Everything. So <laughs> we could start with the obvious. I mean, so you have, I, I would say orgasm, but everybody doesn't experience orgasm. And I work with a lot of people helping them to shift away from searching for orgasm, but orgasm is a good thing. Um, it helps boost self-esteem. It helps boost confidence. It actually helps lubricate your joints uh, in your body and your knees. It helps support sleep. It can be a stress reliever for a lot of people. Um, and, and, and so it's, it's one of those things. And, it's one of those things that we also use to connect to others, to share our love with somebody, to express ourselves to somebody else and to let them know how we might be feeling or what we might be experiencing. And so one of the things that sometimes people, couples especially, don't understand that when one partner is very upset about there not being sex in the relationship is because they perceive sex as love. They perceive sex as connection and as sharing. And when they're not getting that, they're getting this message that I'm, I'm not lovable. I I don't matter. You don't care about me. You don't want to be near me anymore. And it doesn't matter what the verbal expression is. It, it impacts how we are viewed because you don't want to touch me. And touching me is, is meaningful. It's one of the most sacred things you can do between the two people, right? Or however many partners you have, but between two people. So it, it, it does a lot. And again, again, it lubricates those joints. And we need that as we get older. I know I do. And it's also a study that says that um, couples that have sex two to three times a week can actually, or people, period, that have sex two to three times a week, it adds two years onto your life expectancy. That's what they say. On average, I will tell you that quite a few couples, they, they say it's somewhere close to 50% of uh, long-term couples are non-sexual. Non-sexual means that they have sex um, 10 times or less a year. We consider that a non-sexual couple. Uh, and most couples have sex anywhere from one time a month to two to four times a week. And that is anywhere from our younger couples from 20 to 30s to, you know, 41 and 55. And we now know that people are sexual up into their 80s and 90s. Uh, and, and it's good for them. It's a different kind of sex sometimes because of, you know, how our bodies treat us. But yeah. Yeah, uh, if we're ready, I wanted to ask her about sex addiction, uh, sex addiction stuff. Uh, are we good? Uh, you know, Jessica, uh, often in, in our office, right, we see people who uh, complain about sex addiction. Oftentimes, it's one partner that says, my partner is addicted to sex. Yes. Somebody who brings their teenage child, say, my child is... Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously, we have the DSM and this and that, but let's talk more in a humane way. What is a sex addiction? So that's a very controversial topic, Dr. Sabian, Dr. T. Uh, our, our field is split because you have many of us who don't endorse sexual addiction. And then you have um, what we tend to call it, most of us in the field, a uh, uh, is out of control sexual behavior. Uh, Douglas Brown Harvey does a lot of great work around this. And so what we mean by out of control sexual behavior is that we've taken a, a skill that we were using to cope from something and we have now lost control of it. So, you know, it's for a lot of people that I see who show up and say, hey, I have a sex addiction. What I end up finding out is, OK, you began to feel unloved and you weren't being paid attention to. And so orgasm made you feel good and made you feel complete. And so here's the girls in the videos. They didn't talk back. The women in the videos didn't put you down. They built you up. These chat rooms did this. And so what we find is 
it's not necessarily an addiction in the sense of how we think about uh, drugs, alcohol, or caffeine. It's more this idea of my coping skill, I'm using it, and I have now lost a bit of control with it because now it's starting to flood into other parts of my life. Mm. So what started off as something simple because they're getting instant gratification, instant rewards, and that praise, they seek it more because, I mean, let's be honest, us as humans, we want to feel that. So when you get that from another place, you tend to seek it out more. Hence addiction. All of us, it's more of a problem when it becomes a way to cope with certain emotional problems. Do I hear that correct, Jessica? Exactly. It, and, and the thing about it and the reason a lot of people in the field go more towards the out of control behavior as opposed to the addictive behavior is because it does, it's not physically addictive and the sex drive is not an actual drive mm. um, similar to like our, our satiation and those things. It's We use the word drive, but it's not an actual drive. And so that's why we kind of distinguish it because there's no physical dependency that happens as a result of it. Um, and so part of it is, like I said, we, we want love and we want attention and we want support. And we've chosen a way that has been really helpful to us, you know, for that. And the other part is we're saturated. I'm sorry. Sex is everywhere when it comes. To, I can't turn on a show when sex isn't in it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of it is also unavoidable for, for some people in a lot of ways. And so, what I tend to do with people is just help them to understand why they chose this and how they might want to go towards choosing something else that works better for them. Usually it's talk to your partner about what your needs are. Mm. And oftentimes um, couples, they don't do that. Um, talk to one another, which is something really simple, but we know as clinicians that that is really the number one issue in relationships the lack of positive yeah. communication. And also, I, I want Jessica to shine a little light on this. How do you even start a conversation with your partner to explore some of these needs as we refer to? What do you do? How, how do you tell your wife, husband, girlfriend, boyfriend? What do you do, Jessica? So, no, communication is important. Couples actually talk all the time. They're just not, I call it effective. We need to have effective nonviolent communication in order for the couple to be healthy. And so part of that is what I call castle time, which means you call a time out on the business of the couple. We're not talking about the bills. We're not talking about the kids. We're not talking about the dog or the boat or any of that. Let's just talk about us. And so you start with something like, how are you? What has the world been like for you in these last couple of years? How have you changed? And so we just bridge and we start having these smaller conversations. Most of the people that I see have never had a conversation with their partner really about intimacy or sex other than a fight. Mm -hmm. um, there's a really great book for that too. I think it's called Tongue Tied and it's all about communication tips that you can you know, do with your partner. But some of it is just starting with looking at your partner eye to eye because we know eye contact produces oxytocin and having very direct questions. How are you? Yeah. what is it like for you kind of thing mm -hmm. and i think that's the best approach is just to sit down have that open candid conversation um but oftentimes couples are afraid to yeah. even talk to their mate about issues that are going on with their life um and some people feel that they just don't want to bother their spouse with what's mm -hmm. going on with them because they already have so much pressure they didn't want to add to it, but you're still adding that pressure on because you're withholding information from your spouse. And that can lead to other issues in the relationship. And I assume it's a good idea, Jessica, in that conversation, as you uh, uh, described there, to say, I wanted to also know how satisfied are you with our sex life? Is that appropriate? Is that, I, I, I you know, I know many people don't, and I know some do, but. Uh, yeah. But it's a great question because, I mean, this is just me. You could not talk about sex because you think it's going to ruin the mood or you think it's going to hurt their feelings. Or you could suffer through bad sex. Personally, suffering through bad sex would be or much. Grandiose thoughts and you think it's just excellent without <laughs> checking in, right? Or not even caring because we do have some people that don't care 
if their partner is being satisfied. It's right. about them having their release. But you know what, Dr. T, and that goes back to what I talked about, about those early messages and what kind of community did you grow up in? And we see that a lot with people who come from these repressive communities that men are, a lot of men and women are taught, men get off, women just lay there. That women's pleasure is not valid or valuable. And that that comes up so often. And so, and I'm going to skip back to why we talk to our kids about it is because you don't want your kid being in this relationship and, and 20 years down the line and she's like, mom, I, you know, I have a sexist relationship or sex sucks because I didn't know anything. I didn't know sex could even be good for me, that it wasn't just for them. Right. And so, no. So so that communication piece is, yes, ask about your sex life. Talk about things that have changed. What you like to do when you were 21, you may not like when you're 30. And you may definitely not want to do when you're 40 because our bodies won't bend like that forever. Hello. <laughs> Darn it, you talk to a therapist. They want you to communicate with people. Yes. So we have these conversations and that when people come to me, they're like, well, what can we do? Talk. Well, no, no, no. We need a real solution. Talk. And that's my solution for you is start having conversations about sex. If you're if you're dating, if you're thinking about dating, have your list. What are your needs? What are your non-negotiables? What's important for you? What kind of things do you like in sex? Because some people don't talk about sex because they have these secret kinks that they think their partner won't go towards. And what so- are you, are you talking about some of those fetishes? Maybe someone might have a foot fetish or some other kinky type of fetish? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and sometimes it's not even that far into it. Sometimes it's, they want to be spanked. Sometimes it's, I want you to rub my head. Like sometimes it's not things that would be possibly off-putting to a partner, right? So it's that space of just being fearful. Let me. Yeah. Ask, what do I need to get you so that you can be spanked? What yeah. You know, just so start the conversation with uh, children early on. Mm -hmm. and talk to your partners about satisfaction or, and it or sounds like even talking to them early on in the beginning of the relationship and talking to each other about what your needs and desires are so because right away mm -hmm. the average age of marriage has increased is 25 average in the united states that a person gets mm -hmm. married right low life expectancy and all that has to do with that right but also we know that marriage rates are going down from research one of the reasons one of the research pointed out was the availability of sex out there right so before you know you had to get married and now it's just available for many right, people right right and i think that plays into this mindset of well if we care then i can care so to speak which obviously can have negative impact well world. i mean i mean how often has a woman i'm going to be very specific here has a woman heard from a man well, if you don't give it to me, I can get it from somewhere else. I've mm -hmm. heard that ever since I was a teenager. I yeah. never when say I that, was not having sex, and my answer was to go fucking get it because I'm mm -hmm. not giving it to you. But and that's what we're told too. If you don't give it to him, your husband's going to go wander, you know. Or if you don't do this, your husband's going. My, my my grandmother saying that to me, and so these are things that are constantly passed down. And the unfortunate part is they're not true. It's, it's they, right. It's like they're. they're in the yeah. past, we're giving them an excuse when in actuality, no, you should be able to have better self control. If you can't get sex from your mate, then guess what? You need to pleasure yourself. If you want to have an outside relationship, guess what? You and your mate need to have that conversation. Your mate may be okay with it. Well, and, and how do we go about getting our needs met? Do we start a fight or do we come and say, you know what, I, I, I noticed that in the last month or two, we haven't been having sex and we haven't been intimate. And for me, intercourse or oral sex or whatever that is, is a real need. And so I need help understanding how are you able to help me get that need met? Because here's the thing, if we're making a demand, we're really pissed once they say no. But if we're truly asking a healthy request to get our need met, and they say no, then we're like, okay, now I have a couple of choices. I can now go figure out how I'm going to get that need met. We can negotiate and discuss what that might look like as a couple, right? Which means maybe I go masturbate, maybe we open our relationship, maybe this is just a cycle and you ask me to support you through it, but we're talking about it and we're facilitating our way through that conversation. And so 
what I tell people is sex isn't the problem, your relationship is. And, but and, wait, and wait, no, 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 you can, Jessica, we want to thank you for being our guest ah. and for coming back again. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been watching In Session with our very special guest, Jessica Roth. Please join us next Thursday. Um, Are we out of time? I mean, yeah, I we literally one more question. Just one more question. No, no, okay, no. Right. You got more questions, unfortunately. Jessica, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. It was a pleasure speaking to both of you. Thank you, Jessica. Bye, Jessica. Bye.